number 18CA0109M, State of Ohio versus Alyssa Garreau. The State of Ohio has waived oral argument, so we will just be hearing from uh, counsel for uh, Ms. Garreau, Attorney Shelton, and you'll have 15 minutes. Thank you. We've read the briefs, obviously, and are prepared to proceed. Let me know if you're going to reserve time, and I'll let you know uh, as you get close. I'm good, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Sheldon. I represent the appellant, Ms. Garreau, in this matter. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, uh, I assigned three assignments of error, as you can see from the brief. I, I think the f I'd like to begin with just the flavor of this case. I mean, as a trial attorney, you walk into court, the court expects you to be prepared to try the case. I mean, that's number one. Uh, I know counsel in this case, trial counsel, known for probably 30 years. He just was not prepared in this case. He came in, he thought he was going to get a continuance. Judge Warner, and that was my first assignment of error, Judge Warner denied his continuance, asking the court to continue it when the court had previously granted the state a continuance. Uh, but uh, the trial judge said, no, I'm not giving you a continuance, counsel. Uh, even though I understand you're not prepared to try this case, try your case. So the catch when did he come on to the case? I'm sorry. When was he retained, or when was he? When did he start representing this uh, defendant? In the I, case? I believe before October, Your Honor, because he filed a motion to continue uh, in October. I think the continuance was from October 3rd to October 17th. And the problem with that continuance was he cited two common pleas court cases that he had been involved with and asked for a continuance of those cases. And it was moved to the date of trial in Judge Warner's courtroom here in Medina. So yeah. those two Cuyahoga County cases were moved to the same date. The question is, did the court move those to the same date as his trial in Medina, or did he request that date? But th that's not clear from the record. But in any case, him knowing that he had a trial on October 17th at Medina Muni, and the court sets a, a two pretrials the same day, he should have probably contacted Cuyahoga County and said, hey, I got a trial in Medina Muni on that day. Can we do the pretrial a different day? But he didn't do that. So I think counsel came into court thinking, I'm going to get a continuance. Court denied the continuance, which I argued was an abuse of discretion. That's going to be up to you as judges here to decide whether that was an abuse. I think my point was he had given, the judge had given the state a prior continuance. Why not give Ms. Garreau a continuance to allow counsel to prepare, give them one more opportunity to show up on a future date and be prepared to try the case, but that didn't happen. That's why I argued that was an abuse of discretion. Let's be fair to the defense as you were fair to the state. So, Well, and there was no inquiry to Ms. Garreau at all about whether or not she wanted to proceed after her client indicated on the record, correct? Yes. That he was unprepared to go to trial. Was there any inquiry? To I don't her? recall from the record if that was inquired of Ms. Garreau or not, uh, whether or not she wanted to go forward. Um, but my point is, if you're trial counsel and you're coming in to try a case, and I understand he was not prepared, but that's an essential duty we owe to our client, is to be prepared to try the case, right? I mean, you can't just come in on, on, the, on the day of trial and not be prepared to try the case. That's a, that's, a, that's a material duty owed to the client, and if you don't fulfill that duty, prejudice results. In this case, she was convicted, and it's not, a minor conviction. We're talking about a conviction that can't be sealed. It's domestic violence, and it can be enhanced to a future felony if, you know, you know God forbid, she was to ever be accused and charged again for domestic violence. She'd be looking at a felony conviction or a felony, a potential felony conviction. So, it is a significant uh, prejudice to her in this case that he did not thoroughly prepare, sit down with her. I mentioned in my brief there was no conversation preparing. For trial that day with with Ms. Garreau, um, I even indicated in there on the self defense issue, he could have certainly developed that much more than he did with uh, Ms. Garreau on the stand during the case in chief. He could have very, I think he could have developed that significantly to the point where, and, and I made an issue on the jury demand. I mean, never filed a jury demand. He could have had eight members of the community decide the case versus one member that being the judge. And as you know, you need a unanimous verdict in Ohio uh, for a guilty finding. So had he filed a jury demand, well, who knows what the outcome would have been. So well, let me play devil's advocate for you here for a minute. And I think the judge said this, or at least alluded to this. What's to stop an attorney any time from just putting on the record, sorry, I'm not prepared? 
I guess what I'm saying is, is there, when we get, we've read your briefs, but when we actually get to look at the record here, is, is there going to be some indication that there was something other than him just saying that here on the record for us to rely on? Anybody can come in and say that. Right. Well, there was evidence he wasn't prepared. There was no discovery file. Uh, in the case, so I mean, that's typical for counsel. Hey, no file request for discovery. Okay. There was no jury demand filed, so I think the unpreparedness is backed up by the record in this case. He didn't file for discovery, he didn't request a jury trial. Shows up on the day of trial, hey, I'm not ready. Puts on the record, I have to notify, I, I, I believe I have to put this on the record because my malpractice carrier is going to want to know about about this matter and be on the record. So he put that on the record, that he wasn't prepared, that his malpractice care requires him to put this on the record. Um, I, I believe he was totally unprepared, and I think he anticipated a resolution. There was discussions, and I don't know if I put it in the record, there had been discussions about a plea. Off the record. Off the record, right. And, and that and was rejected by the judge. Correct, Your Honor. The judge's policy in the Dunning Meeting Court is you had to have at least it had to be done within 24 hours prior to the day of trial to resolve the case. I think it was actually 48 hours, and now I believe it's one day. You have to come up with a plea and plead at least a day in advance of trial. If you show up day of trial, there's, there's no reduction. You're trying the case. Even so, when there's no jury involved. Even when there's no jury involved. So I think uh, Mr. I think trial counsel felt, one, he was either going to get a continuance, or number two, he was going to get a plea and be able to do the, the, the plea to a reduced charge, and he was not, and I believe he stated on the record, he was not aware of the court's policy. And that's when the court admonished him, saying, well, you have a duty to know the court rules and local rules. That's your, that's incumbent upon you, counsel, to know that. A couple questions. Did the state take a position on the request for continuance? And secondly, did the court cite any inconvenience or prejudice uh, to the parties or the state in denying the request? Well, I, I, I argued, and I'm not sure, Your Honor, about the answer to that question. I do know that there would have been no inconvenience to the parties. Mr. and Mrs. Rowe were married at the time. They came to court together. Uh, they would have returned on a future date. Uh, so there was no inconvenience to them. There was no speedy trial issue. I put my brief they had, and the court had until November sometime to, to try the case on the speedy trial clock. This was October. So it would have even been longer if the continuance was granted. Correct, correct, because that would have told the, told the time clock. So, well, going to, I think, what Judge Tedosio was saying, I mean, you and the state both appropriately quoted the considerations for granting um, a continuance of the, the things we're supposed to consider to see if there is abuse of discretion, one of which is was either party prejudice. Do you know whether the judge on the record went through any of those considerations? I, and if not, well, like I said, we'll see the record. Yeah, and I apologize. I don't recall what there if there was discussion by the court about those considerations. Um, I do know the court says it has a right to control its docket, and you know uh, we just can't. I, I believe there was some reference about we just can't keep continuing cases. But again, this would have been a first continuance by the defense, and the state had already been granted one continuance. So there was clearly no prejudice to the state or the defense in this case to continue it. So uh, on that ground, I would respectfully request the court reverse for the abuse of discretion and not granted continuance. And with respect to the essential duty owed by counsel to his client, reverse on the grounds that um, counsel was ineffective for uh, not being prepared to try the case on that particular day, not filing a jury demand, not filing for discovery. With respect to the last assignment of error on self-defense, obviously, uh, that's a manifest weight argument. I understand that, that manifest weight is a very difficult standard uh, before this court to overcome. Uh, and if the court feels that uh, it's not uh, in violation of the manifest weight of the evidence, obviously that goes back to my other assignment here. Counsel could have really developed that self-defense argument a lot more than he did. So for those reasons, the state or the defense respectfully requests that the uh, Ninth District Court of Appeals reverse the decision of the and that is the court. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Attorney Sheldon. The court will take a matter under advisement and uh, issue a decision in due course. The courts will mail you a copy on the day that the decision is released. And, of course, you can always keep an eye out on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website where the opinions are posted. Thank you again for appearing and arguing. Thank you, Your Honor.